Luke 7, verses 11 through 17. Let's hear God's word together this morning. Soon afterward, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. As he drew near to the gate of the town, uh, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came up and touched the bier, and the bears stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him spread through the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let me pray for us. Father, help us now and ask that you would uh, please just give me clarity as I preach. Pray that your Holy Spirit would be here uh, being at work, doing way, way, way more than, uh, than any of us could ever do on our own. So we ask you now to help us, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I had a friend back in Tennessee uh, named Mr. Ray. Uh, Mr. Ray was in his 70s when we first met. And he walked into my office and he introduced himself to me around 2010. Uh, after he served in the Navy, he spent the rest of his career working for MLG and W. So that was the Memphis Light, Gas, and Water, the big utilities company, uh, where he worked uh, again right up through his retirement. As he was married to, to the love of his life, great lady, had kids, had grandkids that he loved dearly. Uh, it was sort of a, a storybook in some ways. Now, you might expect a guy with such a rewarding vocational background and such a healthy family structure to kick back after he retired. I mean, that's what a lot of guys do. After all, in our little town outside of Memphis was really kind of an ideal place to relax and enjoy life. Had a town square that looked like Mayberry. Uh, it's beautiful, it's affluent, has several golf courses, a couple of which are PGA caliber. Uh, so you can imagine what a lot of guys his age give themselves to once they've uh, taking that last paycheck from work, but not Mr. Ray. Uh, the day that he walked into my office, he explained that he had a ministry, uh, nothing formal. There was no 501c3. There was no staff. It was just him and his stripped-down uh, gold Ford F-150 XL with a camper shell on the back. Uh, he would go around, around our little town there, and he would collect toiletry items, so deodorant, soap, shampoo, things like that, from local hotels, uh, from stores that had ding and dent kind of stuff that they had to get rid of. Uh, and then he also had some kind of just, you know, handshake deals with some other local stores where if they had extra pairs of jersey gloves or extra socks or extra underwear that for whatever reason they couldn't sell, they would give those to Mr. Ray. And so he would load up the back of his truck, all of this stuff, and he would take it into downtown Memphis, and he would deliver to all the homeless shelters around the city. Uh, in the summertime, uh, he would load up the back of his truck with uh, big orange five-gallon coolers full of water and boxes and boxes and boxes of granola bars, and he would drive around the city wherever there were homeless people, and he would stop, and he would give them water, and he'd give them granola bars. Uh, Mr. Ray had wealth and respect and the love of those around him. He didn't have to reach out to those people. In fact, those were people he would never see unless he made an effort to go find them. He could have stayed right where he was, doing his own thing, but his compassion moved him. When the passage that we just read, we're going to see what Jesus did for a woman uh, who was in a situation every bit as desperate as any of the people that Mr. Ray ministered to in Memphis. Uh, Jesus didn't have to respond to this situation at all, and certainly not in the manner that he did, as we're going to see, but his compassion moved him. In fact, Jesus is the very definition of compassion. Y'all know what that word means, the word compassion? Literally, it means to suffer with, to bear someone else's burden. Jesus is compassion in the flesh. That's what we're going to see today. So this morning, let's break down our passage like this. 
uh, three headings. First, the situation Jesus faced. Second, the compassion Jesus displayed. And finally, the way the crowd responded. Okay? So, the situation Jesus faced, the compassion Jesus displayed, and the way the crowd responded. Let's jump in first, looking at the situation Jesus faced. Uh, last year, I went up to Indiana uh, to bury one of my friends uh, who had died after a battle with cancer. Uh, the funeral took place on the outskirts of a small town, and, and so it wasn't even in the town. Again, it was on the outskirts. It was out in the country, and it's on this little bitty road, and so we had the funeral at the church here, and about 75 yards down the road was the cemetery. And so uh, we conduct the funeral service, and then everyone just walked down the road uh, as the hearse brought uh, his body uh, down behind us, and we walk down the road and go uh, into the cemetery to finish the, the service. Uh, that is, you know, and I've, I've participated in a lot of funerals over the years, uh, but that's the closest I've ever gotten to a Near Eastern style funeral procession. Uh, like what you may have seen on television, if you ever watched after, after uh, people have passed away in the Middle East, you'll sometimes see these on TV. Um, shortly after the person dies, the whole community gathers and carries the body down the street, uh, escorts the body to where it's going to be laid to rest. That's what's going on in the passage that we just read a moment ago. So let's go back to verses 11 and 12. Soon afterward, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. So Nain was a, a little town, a village really, about 20 miles from Capernaum and just, uh, just a few miles southeast of Jesus' home in Nazareth. So he's coming into town with his disciples, and there's a big crowd flocking around him. This is still early in his ministry, so he's still getting a bit of the rock star treatment as uh, people want to be around him, and he's pulling crowds everywhere he goes. Now, often Judean towns had a, a defensive wall of some kind built around the community, and there would be one way in and out, just through the city gate, which was also where the elders of the community would gather to discuss civic matters. So this was the primary gathering place, day in, day out, of life in those villages. Now, most first century funerals uh, in, these, in these communities were conducted the day the person died, usually towards sundown. So they were not waiting. Uh, if you've ever known Orthodox Jewish people, uh, it's still the exact same way today. If someone dies in the morning, they're being buried later that evening. Now, rabbinic law required that everybody who was associated with the deceased so friends and family accompany the body to the burial site. In Galilee, where this took place, men would typically see to have the body, and then men would walk immediately behind the body. Then you'd have women would walk behind the men, and then you'd have the professional, the paid mourners, would bring up the, the rear guard, crying, moaning, and those kinds of things to let everyone know that someone had died. And then the procession would carry the body right outside of town to where typically family burial plots were located. So everybody got that picture? That's what's going on right now. Now, any procession like this would have been terribly sad, of course, obviously. Uh, but this funeral procession was especially heartrending. The man who had died was, quote, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. Okay, so this lady had already lost her husband, and now she's, already, and now she's lost her only son. That would be horrible, of course, in any society. But in the world of the first century, this was quite possibly a death sentence. All right? Uh, there was no such thing, of course, as Social Security. People didn't typically have savings, and they certainly didn't have insurance policies. And women rarely worked outside the home. So when her husband had died, in a stroke, she had lost her hopes of both financial and physical Security, but at least she had a grown son who could take care of her to some extent. But now he's gone too. There was no safety net. It's quite possible that the remainder of her earthly existence would have been miserable and brief. Uh, she would likely have died of starvation or exploitation or some combination thereof. Try, 
and I know this is hard because we're separated by thousands of years in a different culture, but try to put yourself in her shoes right now. Okay, think about it. You're grief-stricken. The two men with whom you have been closest in your life are both gone. And you are looking at a future that is at best wildly uncertain, living on the ragged edge of society. And you know that everybody else there knows the score as well. You know that everybody, as they're mourning, they're looking at you and they're thinking about you. What are they thinking? What are they going to be saying tonight when they go home and they're sitting around their table eating? What are things going to look like for you when you wake up in the morning and the house is empty, there's nobody bringing in money, there's no security, there's no safety? Kind of a grim picture, right? That's the situation Jesus faces as he approaches Nain. Let's now look at what he does about it with the compassion Jesus displayed. Uh, as we saw a couple of minutes ago, the events recounted in this passage are in the community of Nain, and that's an important point. I uh, want to make sure you don't miss this. So there was neither an historic nor major strategic reason that Jesus would have wanted to visit that town. It was irrelevant, even by Galilean standards, which was a pretty irrelevant place in general by the standards of everybody else in that area. Uh, for instance, Jesus' time in Nazareth, back in chapter 4 that we looked at, that makes sense, right? That's his old stomping ground. That's home. His time in Capernaum makes sense because a lot of his disciples are from there and it's a decent-sized community. But there is nothing, nothing in Nain. Okay, there's nothing there. Uh, this is not on the route between two larger cities. This isn't on the way to anywhere. They are piping in daylight to Nain. Okay, it's a totally forgettable place. It's mentioned nowhere else in Scripture. Archaeologists didn't even know where it was located until the middle of the 20th century. This indicates that Jesus was not just passing through. Okay? He went to Nain on purpose. He went to Nain on purpose. He went so that he could intervene in this widow's life. Verse 13, And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. Why would he tell her that? I mean, had he not been, you know, had he not been Jesus, this would have sounded like the height of cruelty. Her son's body is not even cold yet. And here he is telling her not to cry for him. Because the reason that he was able to tell her not to weep was why? Look back at the text. He had compassion on her. He's suffering with her. He saw her pain. He's going to do something about it. Verses 14 and 15. Then he came up and touched the bier, and the bearers stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Now, don't skip ahead in your mind to verse 15. We're going to get there in just a minute. Look back at the beginning of verse 14. Then he came up and touched the bier. Now, a bier was a plank of wood, five, six feet long, a couple of feet wide, that the wrapped corpse would be put on to be transported out to the burial site. But here's the deal. Touching that piece of wood was considered the equivalent of touching the dead body, which would make the toucher ceremonially unclean. Uh, if, if not by the, the letter of the Old Testament law, certainly by uh, rabbinic regulations. Nobody's asking Jesus to touch the funeral beer, and nobody is expecting him to. And as he's about to demonstrate, he doesn't need to in order to raise this man from the dead, but he still does it. In fact, Jesus does this a lot in his ministry. In Matthew 8, he touches a leper before healing him with just a word. Later in that same chapter, he touches Peter's mother-in-law's hand as she lays sick with a fever and he heals her. In Matthew 9, Jesus touches the eyes of two blind men before speaking a word to heal them. 
These are just a few examples of a bigger pattern. He doesn't have to touch any of these people. And in the case of touching the leper, that would have made him ceremonially unclean as well. And yet he does it over and over and over again. Why? Why would he do that? I believe at bottom, the primary reason is this. He wants to show these people just how close he is to them. He wants to show that he's in it with them, that, that he cares, that they matter to him, that he isn't some aloof guru or mystic uninterested in these people as people. See, in the incarnation, God came near. He came near. This is a fundamental differentiator between Christianity and every other faith, where in every other faith you have the, the God or God's who are to some extent far away, to some extent uh, aloof to the creation, or in the case of like Hinduism, they're so intertwined with it that there's really no distinction or difference anyway. Only in Christianity do you have God saying, I am going to become human. I'm going to come into this creation to serve my creatures. Only here do you have that. See, Jesus became one of us to be with us, to love us up close and personal in our sin. And he goes out of his way to show this through the simple act of touching. This is compassion in the flesh. Whatever you do, don't miss Jesus' heart, God's heart here. Now look at verse 15 again. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise, Again, if this is anybody else other than Jesus addressing this dead man, you would think he is crazy. I mean, look, grieving folks go to gravesides all the time and, and you know, speak to dead loved ones, right? You've seen that. People go stand over the grave and just, you know, kind of talk uh, to the person. Uh, but they're not telling that person to do something, <laughs> right? That's what Jesus is doing here. For a split second, some of these people in the crowd may have thought he was crazy too. And just like that, with just a word, the dead man sat up and began, and began to speak. So not only does this man have his life back, but his mom has a new lease on life as well, relationally, financially, socially. Now, before we leave this point, there's one other big thing I want you to notice, okay? Look back at the beginning of the passage, all right? So look back at verse 11, first two words, soon afterward. After what? After what? After Jesus healed the centurion's servant in Capernaum, which we looked at last week. Luke didn't have to include either one of these accounts, let alone both. And yet, he does. He does. Here's why. The events in Capernaum show how Jesus responds to faith. We talked about that last week. If you didn't get to hear the sermon... Uh, check it out on the YouTube channel, bring it up to speed. But here, in name, Jesus isn't responding to anyone's faith. You notice that? Not a soul had an inkling of what he's about to do, nor does the text give the slightest indication that anyone thought he could or would do anything, and yet he does. That ought to encourage us profoundly encourage us. If Jesus always waited on people to demonstrate faith before he did something, there would be a lot he would never have done in his ministry or now. If God waited, always waited to be asked or hoped for uh, before acting on our behalf, y'all, we would be in a bad spot. And yet, because of his great love for us, he works on our behalf in 10,000 different ways that we could never anticipate ways that he's not waiting for us to have the right kind of faith or any faith at all. Our faith isn't some sort of a talisman or something that is inherently virtuous. It's not something that puts God in our debt, okay? It's not an algorithm. You know, if I believe like this, God is required to respond like that, okay? That means that we might have really, really strong faith and God still not do what we're asking him to do. 
Or as we've seen, we may have no faith at all and Jesus still choose to work in our lives in powerful ways. So as important as faith is, and it is absolutely vital, we talk about that a lot, faith is not ultimate. Jesus is. Okay, We are not the hero of the story for believing in him. He is the hero for acting on our behalf. Okay, So as critical as faith is, is always subservient to the one in whom we have faith, to the object of our faith, to Jesus. Now, as we noted a few minutes ago, crowds are standing around when Jesus performs this miracle. And it's important for us to see their response because it adds brush strokes to the portrait that Luke is painting of how God's plan comes together in the person and work of Jesus. So now let's look at how the crowd responded been a football fan for most of my life, and I've had numerous occasions I can think of when I'm watching a game, and if you watch football, you know this scenario. You're watching the game, somebody gets hurt, they go down, they're not moving for several minutes, and everybody in the stadium is just like holding their breath, right? And you don't know what's going to happen, you don't know what's going to happen, and finally uh, the person is able to get up and walk off the field or at least be carted off, and when they do, you, like, there's this collective sigh of relief through 80,000 people and then people stand and cheer, you know, and they're excited that the, that the guy is going to be okay. So now try, if you can, to imagine how you would have responded had you been in the crowd that day at Nain. Okay, this man on the beer, he's not injured. He is dead. He is stone dead. Everybody knows it. I mean, on the way to the graveyard, dead. And suddenly, he's sitting up and talking. What would have been going through your mind? What would you have been thinking? Luke tells us how the crowd responds. Verse 16. Fear seized them all, and they glorify God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. Look at that last phrase first. God has visited his people. Typically in the Bible, when it, it says that God visits somebody, it's positive. It's a blessing. Like it's being used here. That's, that's, that's the norm. Uh, interestingly, when Zechariah, John the Baptist's dad, way back in Luke chapter 1, us prophesying about the coming of the Messiah, he starts off by saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. In other words, He's saying in the coming of the Messiah that God is pouring out his blessing on his people. He's keeping his old promises. He's rescuing. He's redeeming. And the crowd sees Jesus literally bring this man back to dead, and they're saying essentially the same thing, even if they don't know all the specifics. But it's what they say right before this that really solidifies that link, that God's at work through Jesus in a particularly powerful manner. Look back at what they say. A great prophet has arisen among us. So Jesus is the ultimate prophet, the one who speaks for God perfectly in every way because he is God in the flesh. But Luke, in how he tells the story, is saying something even more specific, something the original audience within that day may have recognized to some extent as well, and probably those who read his letter would have recognized to some extent as well. Uh, scholars have often noted that Luke intentionally structures um, several parts of his account, this chapter especially, to set up a parallel between Jesus' ministry and the ministries of Elijah and his protege Elisha in the Old Testament. That's so two of the Old Testament's greatest prophets. Uh, we, we perhaps see a bit of this in the previous account, so the healing of the centurion's servant. Uh, in 2 Kings 5, you have Elisha heal a Syrian general called Naaman. Uh, and so not only is he a Gentile military leader like the centurion, but he also sends representatives in his place to speak on his behalf. So there are a couple of parallels in that story. But the parallels really ramp up in this passage. I want you to look at it with me. Okay, so Nain was only about a half a mile from the site of an ancient Israelite village called Shunem. Now, Shunem is where Elijah raises, or Elisha raises 
the only son of a widow from the dead. Even more telling is something that Luke says near the end of verse 15. Look at it again. And Jesus gave him to his mother. Now, that sounds strange. He's not a baby. He's an adult. And his mom is right there. Why would Jesus have to give him to her? Well, Luke writes this way because it's the exact same phrase that's used in the Greek version of the Old Testament when Elijah raises the son of a widow from a city named Zarephath. It says there in that text that Elijah gave him to his mother. It's the same phrase. See, Luke wants his readers who have familiarity with the Old Testament to understand that in Jesus, the ultimate prophet, the final prophet, has come. Their ministries were pointing forward to his. Not surprisingly, then, we read this in verse 17. And reports about him spread through the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. The people know that something big, really big, is happening. In Jesus showing such remarkable compassion to this woman and to her son, they know that God is on the move. We all love stories of compassion. I think everybody does. I've never met anybody that doesn't. Uh, just the other day, I read one that left me shaking my head in wonder. I mean, it really did. So there was a guy named Dan Black uh, over in Wales. So that's, you know, if you think about England, the southwest part that like sticks out off England, that's Wales. He's from Wales. Uh, and he, when he was in his early 20s, he was 22, uh, suffered an accident. And when he did, it left him paralyzed well uh, from the waist down and he learned several years later about a stem cell treatment that could give him the opportunity to walk again but uh, his medical care medical plan there in England uh, their health system was not going to cover the cost of it so he knew he was gonna have to save the money so he scrimped and saved and, and for several years and finally got together the 20,000 pounds so around $25,000 U.S. that it was going to take to get this stem cell treatment. Man, he was excited. He was ready to be able to walk again. But, but, after he saved up the money, he heard about a young boy named Brecken Vaughn. Uh, Brecken was born with cerebral palsy and had never been able to walk unaided. Rather than pursuing the treatment he needed and that he had saved up for, Dan gave that money to Brecken's parents so that he could get the treatment instead. And within two years, Brecken was walking on his own. I saw a picture of it. When asked why he gave the money away like that, uh, Dan responded, quote, I had 22 years of walking before my accident, whereas Brecken had never known what it was like to even walk for 22 seconds. Y'all, that's compassion. That's compassion. That's seeing somebody else's need and bearing that burden with them. Giving yourself to meet their need. Y'all know what that sounds like? At least what the contours of that sound like? It sounds a lot like the gospel. It sounds a lot like the gospel. In fact, the gospel is the greatest example of compassion ever displayed. Jesus is compassion in the flesh. He saw our lostness, our sin, our guilt, our shame. He saw our need and he was under no obligation to come. Right? God was under no obligation to say, I'm, I'm going to send my son one of these days for those people. And yet he sent Jesus, and Jesus willingly came, empowered by the Spirit, to take our sin, to take our shame, to take our guilt, to face God's justice on our behalf. He gave himself, not merely of himself, but gave himself for us. And then he got back up out of the grave to show that he had done, that he had accomplished what he set out to do. Our role is, 
is to trust him, to believe in the compassion that he came to show us. The compassion that this healing at Nain all those years ago was just kind of a foretaste of. That is, as he raised that man from the dead that day, again, it's a preview, it's a small picture of what God's going to do one day for those who trusted in Jesus, that he will raise us as well. That's the hope that we have in the gospel. Amen? Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for our time together this morning. And we thank you for helping us, for being with us. Father, we, we, need, uh, we need you. We need the good news. We need your Holy Spirit to empower us to trust you. And so please do that. Give us grace and strength now we ask. And we pray these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.